Hi everyone. I'm Dale Pinkert. I'm the face of face. Oh, looks like I can't turn my camera on. Weird. Okay. Anyway, stop video. I want to do a little coaching uh, this morning. Hello, everyone. How are you doing, Brock, Kevin? Ren, Ingmar, Nikita, Kevin, Samir, everyone. You could call me Dale or Coach Samar. All right. So, you know, we cover a lot of things here, DJ, Didier, Bill. We cover, and in the morning, uh, you know, I go over different instruments that I see. But I just want to tell you about uh, my experience on the floor of the CME. I knew traders that were in the cattle pit that never left the cattle pit. That's all they traded. They knew that market like the back of their hand and they did pretty well. They didn't diversify into hogs and currencies and everything else. So, you know, I know um, Steve talks about screening and following a lot of things so that, you know, at times, yeah, <laughs> at times so you could find things, you know, sometimes what you mainly trade, there's nothing to do. And that's the main reason, in my view, to screen everything else so that you could remain active. <clears throat> but, you know, I recommend, especially for people that are uh, fairly new to trading, to narrow their fo focus to a couple of instruments and get to know them well. Uh, get to know every, you know, support level, every formation. Uh, you don't have to be a portfolio trader to make money. I mean, let's even talk about uh, investing.com viewers are here today. So if you were long Facebook after the COVID crash or almost anything, did you have to be in a portfolio? So then this brings me to another point, <clears throat> recognizing relative strength and weakness within a complex. So here we have the dollar right here, you know, on the verge of giving it up. I think it's a buy right here, okay, with stops under the low of the day, okay? I mean, if it doesn't hold here, we're going to take out two and a half and we're going to, I don't know, 91.40. That's one of Andre's uh, targets off a real nice harmonic pay, uh, workup that he did. But, you know, the euro is weaker than the pound. So, you know, there's a chance we could fade from here and you're wrong over the high. But you look at this euro, um, you look at cable, and then you look at Aussie. What's the weak sister? Which one's demonstrating, if you want to be long the dollar, which one's demonstrating the most weakness? Is it the European currencies? Or is it the commodity currencies? Okay, Jess, I like it. I'm looking for 70.50 for the first target there. Okay, anyway, I'm just not talking about the fundamentals. I'm just talking about the chart and the the action here. I mean, this is taken out early week highs. Aussie hasn't, okay? So uh, just a demonstration. You want to be short on rallies, the relative weakness, and you want to be long on dips, the relative strength. So I just wanted to make a few points that you don't have to trade 10 different instruments and you don't even have to know. That's why when I go through things and say, I don't know, it's okay. Because you only it really only takes one. Yeah, it is. And um, that is weaker. The only thing, yeah, right, Nikita, I was looking at that, the Aussie Kiwi is tempting for a top pick the last couple of days. So here you go. You know, we're not, 
here's their two hour, we're not making new highs. There's a daily, pretty good reading on the daily, hard to fade. We are confirming this new high in the daily, that's important. That's why I'm being patient too. But you look at some other time frames: four hours not confirming, two hours not confirming, one hour is not confirming, 15 minute is even the 15 minute is not converting here. Okay, so um, this uh, I'm short the Aussie because I'm actually looking for a turn here. Okay, so right now it doesn't look like it's going to happen. But uh, although Kiwi is the weakest, uh, I'm short Aussie, okay? Because I think that this uh, Aussie Kiwi, <coughs> this pairing is pretty stretched. So uh, that's really what I wanted to talk about to everyone. Let's see what else is going on. Um, you know, you have uh, another reason for Aussie and Kiwi is the other commodity currency. CAD is making new lows right here. Okay, CAD is making new lows. Aussie isn't making new highs. So here's my first target for it down here. And um, getting to stock indexes, I think we were about 30 handles away from, uh, I think the high was 33.98. And we're starting to diverge on multiple time frames and S&Ps. There's your daily, four hours still, you know, uh, we made a new high. Look at this glaring divergence. We could probably even make another high here. Two hour diverging at this new high. So I think between now and the Monday, Tuesday, we're gonna have a high. Yeah, NASDAQ has been the weak sister, but I was looking at this on NASDAQ. It's the uh, two hour confirmed. And more than that is the four. See this right here? So what would be um, a short to me for XGAL? would be NASDAQ making new highs over the next three days and the four hour reading stay under 70. So I'm thinking the next three days I'll be taking a shot there. That would also favor the short side of Aussie. Commodity currencies um, seem to um, suffer worse during some kind of risk off. So that's my review. Any any other market you guys want me to take a look at before I hand it over to Blake? Give me a why if you, well, I just did it. Okay, I'll, I'll just do the Euro because uh, the whole team's here. This could be a failing rally in Euro here. Okay, so, you know, but my preferred short is this. Why do I have to be a hero? Oh yeah, five to one. On the they're doing it on the Nasdaq 100, or they're doing it on um, Tesla. They're splitting the Nasdaq. Sell rallies, Martin. No joke. I'm going to let the rest of the team cover it. Okay, so uh, Blake, how are you? Everyone wants to know everything and uh, Blake's bias chart covers all the majors. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, hey, good morning, hey, Coach. Buddy. Hey, buddy, how are you? Uh, good, just, you know, it's, it's a really, really, um, you know, quiet but grinding session. The dollar's been, yeah. you know, just, just kind of pulling lower uh, in, in, a, in an overall range, so... Yeah, you know, dog uh, days of summer, bro. Until it uh, is, you know, people. Don't, I'm not sure people took vacations like they did last year in the middle of a pandemic. But you know, no. I noticed that every year there's kind of like that thing that's programmed in us, like you know, birds that uh, you know fly away for the winter. That everyone gets back to business after Labor Day. I really thought that this summer was going to be different. 
I, re I really yeah. did. I, I was, uh, you know, I was in the camp that, oh man, you know, here we go. We're going to have a summer where everybody's in front of their computers. Everybody's trading. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be wild, you know, but unfortunately. Well, we got a couple the, of weeks, you know, in the, I, I think that it, <laughs> Labor Day. No, only, no, you can, st you can just stick a fork in it. I think we're done. I think we're done for the month. Uh, okay. No, I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm joking. I mean, it, it really, we, we could still have some volatility. I'm just saying that it, it's, I expected more volatility this summer than we got. Yeah. So yeah. that, that's what I, that's, that's all I'm saying. And, and, um, and yeah, I mean, uh, you know, August, we can still see some volatility, uh, the, the second half of this month for sure. Yeah. Uh, remember we are in an election season, so, um, things can, things can definitely pick up at any moment in time. So, um, um, anyway, what do you think but, a euro here, Blake? Uh, is it, you think it's still worth a short with stops over the high recent high, uh, or is it a, I don't know, no trade. Well, I mean, this wasn't the, this, I, I, first of all, A, I think it's a short, but B, I wasn't, I was looking for a little bit higher uh, personally and um, not, not necessarily at these levels. Uh, so if you look at the Euro dollar, I was looking for this uh, confluence up here around 118.70. And that's not to say that we won't get there today. We, we could definitely get there today. So yeah. Um, uh, I was looking, especially with, with stocks as strong as they are, the dollar should stay relatively weak. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm actually, and I'm going to write this down on the bias chart anyway. So just, just to a answer your question, I, I think that you can play this range. What I'd rather do is rather be short the Euro dollar at the 118.70 level with a decent stop in place versus being short right here near the middle of the range, if that makes sense. Right. So, um, so I'm going to write down that resistance right now. Uh, one, whoops, the enter button too. Uh, 118, dang it. Hold on. One eighteen seventy, I think is resistance. It's still, but remember we're still in a bullish trend. I, I don't want to, um, you know, dismiss the uh the um i don't want to dismiss the importance of the bullish trend that we're in we're, we're still in a very bullish trend what i've been hoping was going to happen but with stocks up here it's hard for it to happen is i've been hoping the euro dollar would pull back a little bit but um you know nothing's pulling back stocks aren't pulling back that means the dollar's not going to rally you know the, the, all the same same type of arguments here. So let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, where support would be. So support today, in my opinion, is going to be the lower end of this. And actually, I'm going to, I'm going to drop this support zone down a little bit. It'll be right here. It's going to be right around one. Oh, I guess that comes in right at 118. So 118 should offer support. But 117 below that, 117.10 actually, you guys have to remember all the stuff that we've been putting out all week. So 118 is gonna be support today, minor, should be minor support today. All right, let's go over to the cable. So the cable, if you're wondering why the cable is so strong, just go look at the, go look at the guppy. Go look at the pound yen, which I'm not gonna go over right now. But the pound is, uh, the pound dollar is closing in on the 618 retracement that comes in at 131.15. Uh, I was sitting here this morning, you know, we were in the ch chat room and looking at the 131.05 and I was like, man, I should just short it up here. But it's like, it's hard to, when, when things are just kind of bouncing around, it's like, do I really want to take a stand being long the dollar against the cable when it, the, the pound yen's ripping and stocks are moving higher? It's tough. It's a tough, it's a tough trade right now. So um, but I do think that this is resistance, you know, uh, the, the 618. I think that we are making lower highs. And one of the things about the cable that you have to kind of pay close attention to, it, it has been underperforming. So just think about that a little bit. It, it's been, you know, a relative underperformer as of late. Um, you know, I know it's, it's up today, but, uh, but if you look at the Euro compared to like the Euro, it's, it's, it's not performing as well in my opinion. All right. So 
16 is gonna be resistance. So 131, let's just write 131.15. Uh, and, and then beyond that, obviously it's uh, one, if things get going, it's 131.85 is the key resistance. So support today is gonna be dips down to one, well, it's, at, it's, at, it's right here. I mean, 130, I mean, that's just key, right? And is the cable we can we can get down there for whatever reason um aussie so the aussie uh the 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 aussie employment was good it was a, it was a good number One hundred fourteen thousand jobs were created i think unemployment the unemployment rate went up just a hair but you know the participation rate was good so all, all in all the the aussie employment was good but the aussies surprisingly capped and that is and must be noticed right so today the 7190 i mean look at how we've just been nudging up against their still resistance right so 7190 i i still think it's bullish while we're above 7070 so you guys 70 75 i know i've written down that number probably every day for the last two weeks but I mean, it's just, it is what it is. It, 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 you know, we are above this key support and while we're above this key support here, there's, you know, no real, real reason to be bearish while we're above this breakout point here. And I, you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll do this really quick. I want to make that, uh, a dash line too big a dash dot yeah dash is fine this way we kind of know where it's at you know that that's just that's just the breakout point you know period that's um that's where that's that's where we're uh that's where it's you know as long as we're above that it's supported all right let's take a look at the kiwi let me make sure i've got that bullish okay so the kiwi you know is trading a little heavier um so, but, but we're, but we're still above that 65 cent level, which, you know, we'd been talking about all week. This is pretty good support here. I think while it's above 65 cents, you got to be careful being on the short side because it's just the dollar is just generally speaking weak. All right. But if the dollar does start to bounce, then, you know, we'll be paying attention at that 65 cent level. And for intraday, this is an hourly chart. 66 cents is resistance. Uh, the Kiwi is underperforming the Aussie. You can obviously see it in the Aussie New Zealand. So I'm going to uh, keep it on range. You know, I've been, I've been switching back and forth between being bullish and being on range. But the thing is, is we are below the 66 cent level, which is, you know, this breakout point here. So I, I still think it's bullish. It's just, you know, you got to be a little careful. Hold on. What's that? Apple kicks off four part debt offering, including 40 year bond. Apple is selling a 40 year bond. Yeah. Because they don't have enough uh, cash, do they? Y yeah. Ridiculous. What the, f <laughs> well, first of all, I I'm going to tell you, I I'll tell you this right now. I wouldn't buy anything in technology. That's a 40 year, anything. I'm, I mean, you, it, it, t t take take a look at anything in technology. I mean, the 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 Apple may be riding high right now, and look, I use a lot of Apple products. I, I have an iWatch. I have uh, you know, I I've been using iPhones for probably since the second version. I don't know, um, I, but but realistically, there will be somebody that will come along and probably dethrone Apple at some point, right? I don't know. It always, always happens, man. Always it, happens. It always, yeah, I mean, you know, whether it's a, your, your, your Toshiba television or Zenith or, you know, I, I mean, I'm just saying just, you know, over, over time, there's just, no way. No way. Just, good morning, guys. Just 13 years ago, I just jumped on the webinar, so I don't know if you mentioned it, but just 13 years ago, there was everybody believed that Nokia is going to be the king of phones forever. Just yeah. yeah, yeah, and Motorola, and I mean, 
look, it's, I, it's scary. I, I, hell no. And especially when you don't, when you have, uh, when you, when you don't have the, uh, the founder, I mean, you know, when Steve jobs died, I think, I, I mean, look, I, you know, uh, uh, cook has done a good job as far as navigating the company, uh, navigating it, but the, but the ingenuity went out with the, the passage of Steve jobs and, and the creativity in my opinion. So, I, I, but like I said, I use Apple products, but they're just maintaining now. It's not, you're not creating anything new. But anyway, all right. That's a big debate that could go on and on and on and on for hours and hours and hours. And, uh, and, and there's no winner there. So uh, I'm going to go over to the Canadian. So the Canadian um, is just the next one down. I'm so irritated. I've been trying to play the Canadian on the long side. This one has really, really irritated the heck out of me. We are breaking through lows and, uh, and I had my stop down here and, um, I, I told everybody when I got stopped out this morning, I'm like, watch, it, this is where we get our 50 pip bounce, which I, I, and, and I joke around with this a lot with, with our traders. I usually keep my stops pretty wide, um, you know, just, but when I have them tight, like I, I kept this one relatively tight and it's a small position. It wasn't big, but the, the thing is, is when I get stopped out, it's usually like, the time to reverse. So I, I'm when I say it's probably going to rally substantially, I'm half joking about that. I'm I'm actually quite serious that it, <laughs> it probably is going to rally. And um, anyway, but here here's here's the way I'd be looking at the U.S. dollar Canadian right now, it, it, because if you think about it, this is right here the breakdown point. That is where we would reverse. So if we're in if we're in this descending wedge here. Uh, above uh, one one thirty two, you, you could actually say one thirty two fifty is probably pretty good resistance today. I, I'm not. I, I won't even put it on bearish. I know it's starting to break down today, but don't get don't get too excited about that. I I I still think that the 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 the, uh, the um, uh, Canadian is acting much better than the. Um, than, than a lot of these other, or it's actually acting, excuse me, a lot worse than a lot of the other major currencies. So, um, but for right now, the next support for the, uh, for the dollar Canadian would be the 127% extension of this move. Plus it's a long-term trend line that comes in. Whoops. There's a weekly chart, right? It comes in around 131.80. So that's going to be your next level support. 131.80. Okay. Uh, let's go over to the Swissy. Swissy is range bound, just if you guys haven't seen it. Um, there it is. So support being 9050, resistance being 92. Actually, it's 92 and 9240. I think it's the same levels we've been writing down every day this week. So 9050, 92, 92.40. We're in a bearish trend while we're below that 92.40 level, but you know, can always set up for a double bottom. US dollar, Norwegian Krona, uh, we are at the 161% extension at uh, 888. I think this is actually pretty good support. There's a bigger 161% extension comes at 881. So 881 and 90, by the time we get up there, it'd be nine. So uh, eight. 81.9 bearish yen dollar yen continues to hold up pretty well um, if, if you guys haven't seen it the euro yen looks strong the the, 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 the guppy is strong um, but we are struggling at this 50% uh, retracement that we've been talking about, and that's at uh, 107. So 107, then the next stop would be 107.20, which is 161% extension of this move down. Uh, that comes in right there. So I'll write down 107, 107.20, and then 107.70 would be next. But uh, I have a hard time being bullish here. Um, support. 
106.50 is the breakout point. I think that's the number we wrote down yesterday too. So we're gonna, whoops. Dollar index, let's look at the dollar index. Same, same crap as the Euro basically is range bound. Um, and let me delete this really quick because we held those range highs, which, you know, obviously that comes in at 94. 94 is key resistance, but let's look at support here. 94 it is bearish. Well, we're below 94. Sorry, guys. As you know, getting up in the th at 3 o'clock in the morning doesn't do me any justice. So we have 93 support right here, and then below that would be 92.50. So 93 is the 618, and that is holding. So we should take note of that. 93, whoops. Hold on, let me just make sure. That was 92.50. It's still the same support down here. Yeah. Intraday, 93, uh, 93. Okay. All right, let's talk about dollar max. Um, Banksico rate decision uh, today. Uh, it's at 2 p.m. Eastern. So it's about five and a half hours from right now. Um, we're range bound 2260, 2225. I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, talk much more about the range boundness of the dollar max. However, um, it's, it looks poised to break soon. Um, now remember we came out of a down channel, so that's why I'm bullish. All right. I've been bullish ever since we broke out of this resistance. We've just been kind of holding and maintaining. The reason why that is is because stocks are strong. If stocks ever weakened, um, the dollar Mexican peso would trade up towards 24, probably. All right. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with this dollar Mexican peso. Um, now, the market's expecting the uh, for Banksico to cut rates from five to four and a half percent. I think 24 out of 26 economists, or is it 22 out of 24? Anyway, majority of them are expecting a half a basis cut, but a hawkish hike or hawkish cut, excuse me. Um, it's to be seen, it's to be seen how that would affect the peso if they are hawkishly cutting. That means they cut rates and you basically make you believe that they're not gonna be cutting rates much more. Um, that might be, actually be viewed as a negative for, for, the, uh, for the peso. As uh, the markets tend to celebrate, the currency celebrates when you have a central bank that is just being more accommodative. So if they're not being as accommodative or if they, you know, if they cut, you know, by half a basis point, but, but but they basically lead us to believe that that's going to be it. Um, the dollar max might actually go higher. So just think about that, uh, you know, as we go into today. Okay. Uh, but support is at, and, and I'll be obviously in the chat rooms um, regarding the peso because I do have exposure. So 2260 is... Uh, in my opinion, resistance. I believe if we break uh, 2260 for whatever reason, um, we should read oh, that. That's a double, triple, quadruple bottom. That, that'll that just take us back up to 2290 again. All right. Um, last yeah, but we not least. Uh, we have numbers in about 30 seconds, by the way. Oh, crap. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Well, uh, unemployment claims, right? Yeah. Uh, initial jobless yes, claims expected 1.1. Million uh, continuous jobless claims expected uh, just below 16 million. Okay, there you go. There's your data flash. This comes with Forex Analytics, by the way. So if you um, use Forex Analytics, you get that. This is almost as fast as the Bloomberg. Um, you'll see the Bloomberg data come out, but crap. This is Bloomberg over here. Uh, 
uh, what jobless claims right here. They haven't been released. Oh, look, they they hit here, and they haven't even hit Bloomberg. They hit him. They hit on Data Flash before they hit Bloomberg. Wow, that's doesn't happen nice. often. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit better overall, both the initial and continuing. Yeah, not, nothing magnificent, but a little bit better than expected, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right, well, that's it. Talk to you later. No, I'm just kidding. I, I still have to do, <laughs> I have to do uh, gold and silver. And, See you oh, tomorrow. No, Bye-bye. Uh, stocks. See you later. Okay, so, <laughs> so obviously the equity markets, I mean, the S&Ps we're, were how many points? What is that? 15 points from all-time highs, roughly? I mean, what do you say about that? I mean, it's just path of least resistance, you know? Everything's going up. Just continue to go up, all right? So 3,400, while we're above 3,300, it's bullish. Gold... Uh, like I had mentioned to you guys the last couple of days, uh, and I'll reiterate with gold, um, gold is bouncing around between 1900 and probably 2000 now. So, you know, um, here, move that. So the 618 comes in at 1994, so that's 2000. Uh, like I said, support's probably going to be at 1900. I think we shook the trees here. Um, it, and in the case we break into new lows, I, this is where I'd be a buyer. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm not trading gold, and I own physical, but I just don't, I'm not trading trading it. But if I was going to trade it, I'd buy it on that 38% retracement on a dip to new lows. That's where I'd be a buyer. But that's, you know, I don't know if we're going to get down there, frankly. Um, so I, I still believe 1900. Everything can happen. 1995. That's right. That's right. And I still think we're bullish. Because remember, we're still, uh, you know, yeah. holding, basically maintaining the all-time high. So there you go. Your bias chart is done. Um, all right, guys. Every, I am everyone now get their pol Polaroids out. Yeah, go ahead and take a picture of the bias chart. And um, uh, last thing I need to mention, guys, if you're not part of the Forex Analytics family and you want to be part of the Forex Analytics family, please visit our webinar sponsors. Uh, Pepperstone Securities is our is our um, our sponsor for anybody that's outside of the U.S. or Canada. If you want to um, possibly get Forex Analytics for free for a period of time, you can actually um, open a Pepperstone account. And then from there, once you start trading live, you'll get two months free when you open a live trading account, two additional months uh, if you trade over five, five standard lots. And then if you're in the United States or Canada, please visit Forest Park FX. They are also our webinar sponsor and they will help you find a broker that is best suited for your needs, but also gives you cash back rebates. So make sure you visit Forest Park FX. All right, so guys, I'm gonna pass it over to you and I wanna thank everybody for being here with me and Steve you, Stelios, Blake. Dale, it's all yours. Thank, thank you, Blake. Thanks, Blake. Thank Thanks, you guys. very much. Good luck, Have great, buddy. Just, hey, coach. guys, you know what? Uh, uh, we just we, about take, here, we the, take orphans, what? right? Trading <laughs> orphans in the family. <laughs> Just to adhere that they need to follow the steps. Uh, once they uh, open an account, they need to, you know, mail us, etc., and you know, request yeah. the extra months. We check it up, and you know, they have a Forex Analytics subscription for two months. And if they trade five lots, those two months become four. Okay, so what were you saying? We take orphans, oh, really? Orphans, orphans. If anyone what, out there is, you know, feeling lonely and they need, they trade and. They're an orphan. Not many of their friends do it. They don't understand what they're doing. Their friends think they're crazy. Their family's telling them, get a new job. 
I say join our family and have that emotional support and go through the twists and turns of trading with people that are going to be supportive in our chat room. So welcoming all orphans to join today. I think there's an orphans discount on a six or 12 month subscription that Joe Perry will handle. Katan, you're an orphan. You're okay. All right. So, um, Stelly also put Joe's email in there and uh, on Thursdays we're doing this. So if you want a six or 12 month subscription and you're looking to be adopted, we'll take you in and we'll do everything we can to help make you <laughs> successful and at the minimum help you not blow yourself up. There you go. There's Joe's. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, guys. Hey, um, my hey everybody. Pitch. Boys Town, we're all, and <laughs> girls are welcome too. Boys Town was an orphanage. Andy Rooney was in that one. Uh, made me cry. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. You're, you're, you're savvy like me. Yeah. I, I cried. <laughs> I cried when Bambi's mom got caught in the forest. Yeah. I know, that was <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> all right. Uh, so what, what do you guys think? So, What's news? um couple of things to mention. Let's get data out of the way. Uh, we had Australian employment change came in a lot better than expected at uh, plus 110k or so. Interestingly, the job losses from, uh, what was it, um, April and May or May or uh, May and June, uh, over half of them have been taken back in Australia, which is, you know, it's quite um, encouraging. Um, and then we had jobless claims here in the U US, nearly another million. Uh, that's a little bit of a different story, but uh, otherwise it was very light uh, in terms of data. We did have some more uh, stuff coming out of the US. Uh, first of all, uh, the Democrats and the um, Republicans are still not um, agreeing on, on another stimulus package. Uh, Nuchin says that uh, Pelosi doesn't want to compromise. Pelosi will, says that Nuchin doesn't want to compromise. It's a, it's a story. But anyway, the bottom line is that um, they're, not, uh, they're not agreeing yet. On the other hand, Larry Kudlow said, I'm not too worried. The economy is doing great. So, Absolutely. You know, so if it's, if it's doing great, if the economy is doing great, then there, is, there should be no discussion about stimulus, right? Yeah, or raising rates from zero. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah. we can just, you know, get rates back to like more normal levels, cut all stimulus because <laughs> after all, the economy is doing great. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a good point. Booyah. So um, we also had uh, Trump tweeting quite a lot uh, this morning. Uh, uh, he said, he said uh, no, actually he was he's more um, talking himself up um, for the election, so he's, he's saying, look, you know, if I get re-elected, the dollar is going to be even stronger. Uh, this obviously um, is a direct contradiction to what he's always been saying for the last years, that the dollar is too strong, it's hurting growth and manufacturing. But who cares about that? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's what he's saying today. And he also said he's going to cut capital gains tax uh, to 15% in his second term. So, you know, promises from politicians, nothing new, everybody does it. And um, uh, this is uh, what uh, Trump has been saying this morning. Uh, now, on to markets. The stock markets, you know, S&P is very close to new all-time highs. I still think we're going to get them. The market needs to get them. Shorts need to get uh, basically all out of it. And then everybody realizes markets can only go up forever. They get long. And then we can have a proper leg lower. But, you know, one step at a time. Um, precious metals, I've been talking about these for a while now. Um, I'm still running a quarter of position long silver just because I never want to be flat. Uh, but I do think there is going to be a, the correction that we saw a couple of days ago has got, is going to have more legs. I think um, it's a bit premature to be buying the dip. That's my, my humble opinion. I think, I, gold can, I think gold can easily get to 1800 and silver can easily get to 21. Though those are the levels I'll be personally looking to start to load up again. Um, and uh, another thing I want to talk about is bonds. Uh, if you see, I'm, you know, I've been saying this for a while, I'm short bonds. I have been for a while. It's, it costs pretty much nothing to, to hold that position. I'm down like half a percent or something like that. Uh, treasuries and bonds are 
going lower a little bit. And, you know, today's story about Apple just tells you everything you need to know, in my opinion, about bonds of any type. You know, when you have a company like Apple who's sitting on what, what is it, 400 billion in cash? And they're, they're issuing 40-year uh, bonds. That tells you that they think that uh, rates, especially long-term rates, shouldn't be there. And frankly, they, they, I agree, they shouldn't be there. So you know, when they're taking advantage, when a company like Apple takes advantage of that, it just shows you, in my opinion, that something is where it shouldn't be. So I, Central banks have completely destroyed the markets because, in essence, they, they've transformed more or less all assets to risk-free assets, which makes zero sense. Yeah. Yeah. And for people, you know, I don't want to be misunderstood about equities. I, I have a bearish bias. I'm not short and I'm not long either. I haven't, I've missed this run. I, I, I went long some in late March. Not, a, not enough as always. Um, I have, I've had a bearish bias, but I'm not short yet. I've missed this run and I'm, you know, I'm happy I've missed it. It's okay. I, you know, I caught silver. I caught Norway. I caught other stuff. But uh, I'm not short, not yet. I will see how it goes. You know. Um, and uh, that's uh, pretty much it. We don't have anything else data-wise today. You mentioned I, uh, boons, by the way, Stelio, before. Yes. Um, you know, I, I wrote that in the weekend analysis. Uh, boons were testing a you know, very nice confluence of multiple resistances here. The longer-term channel, this ascending channel, the 88.6% FIB of this move lower. And, you know, the rebound higher was clearly, uh, you know, both showing momentum divergences and uh you know waning and we do we do indeed see now a move lower uh so i, I do think that you know this was a nice uh, risk reward opportunity being uh, from close to 178 being uh short the boons and i wouldn't be surprised if we actually see this uh move unfold you know uh lower you know significantly lower and we can still be you know in a long-term bullish consolidation but you know we, we have a lot of room to to move to the downside even within that context yep yeah i agree and here's the 10 year by the way so 10 year you know currently trying to break through this uh ascending trend line support if it does it's going to open up more downside but you know with especially the treasury market being now a <laughs> more or less one buyers one yeah. buyer's market, you know, I, I, I would be very, very, very skeptical about, you know, how much uh, it can move to the downside for the time being. Yep. That's why it will. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it might. Because it's you're not, not be the only one that has that feeling as, you know, everyone feels like they're fighting the Fed um, looking for higher yields here. Which no, they I do probably believe that. Are. I do believe that the Fed is going to eventually lose totally control. Uh, do I think we're there yet? I don't think. I don't think we're there yet. That, that's, you know, that's the only yeah. difference. Okay. Um, you know, I'll, uh, if we're done with the rest, Stelio, I think I'll start from where I usually start, which is, you know, having a first look at of what's happening with the DXY. And the DXY tells us more or less what it has been telling us for several days now, it, it's telling us Nothing. that the tumble lower has... No, actually, I think it's telling us a lot of things, uh, Dale. Okay. It's telling us that, that the downside momentum has clearly uh, stalled. But on the other hand, it's telling us that bulls keep failing in actually, uh, you know, uh, managing to, uh, to, to push the index higher. And that's... You know, especially given the fact that we got rejected once again yesterday from 94. Uh, you know, the more days, the more hours and the more days we spend within this little rectangle, uh, the more the chances increase that we're just not going to rebound higher and we're just going to resume lower, breaking through like 9240, uh, which is roughly where support is, 9240, 9250. Uh, and you know, get at least one more leg lower before we can even consider, uh, you know, a strong rebound to the upside. Perhaps, perhaps the likeliest scenario would be something like that. I'm not saying that the chances of breaking through 94 
uh, are zero, no, they're not. And, you know, as long as we remain in this rectangle, you know, you, you, you should be open to the possibility. But I'm saying that for every day that passes and we don't, I think that the chances of just, you know, breaching through support and seeing at least one more uh, leg to the downside significantly increase. So uh, I, I think that we might uh, get higher dollar prices only after we uh, we see lower a lower low for the time being. And you know, you know, after you know examining the DXY, it's not surprising that the Euro USD looks you know as a mirror image consolidating probably before seeing another leg to the upside. The cable more or less the same deal here. Here it is. Perhaps that's not the formation we should be focusing on, but more or less something like this. Right. Um, so I, I think it's quite dangerous trying to fade uh, dollar weakness just yet. Not from what I'm seeing here. I can tell you that much. Um, you know, also considering the fact that, uh, as Blake mentioned, uh, there is no doubt uh, stocks remain very well bid. You can have a look at the NASDAQ. We can have a look at the S&P. You can have a look at the Dow Jones. You can have a look at the IWM. You know, in varying degrees, you know, they're doing pretty well. And there is no technical damage done or not, e not even close to getting any technical damage done. And we know that as long as risk assets remain well bid, you know, it's an extra reason uh, why you wouldn't necessarily expect to see um, a stronger dollar. I, I do think that we're going to see a more decent dollar rebound that will coincide with some uh, risk of move because, of course, we're going to see risk of moves on the way. I mean... You know, even if we assume that the, uh, you know, uh, infinite amounts of, of stimulus and inflation created by the Fed uh, will keep stocks elevated for a long period of time, there will still be on the way uh, sharp corrective moves lower because usually these type of binary markets, they either grind slowly higher or uh, produce sharp short-lived corrections lower, which is more or less what I expect for gold to happen uh, as well. I mean, I believe that this corrective move lower that we're seeing in gold and silver, it, it is sharp. I think it might actually unfold even further to the downside, but I do think that it's going to be short-lived. I think it's going to more or less mimic the characteristics of the move we had back here in March, which was a rather strong move lower. I mean, we went from like above 1700 to 1450 within a matter of a few days. And then the market just forgot all about it and, you know, kept grinding higher and then even accelerated higher. I think, you know, this move lower is going to probably be, you know, bigger than this one um, might, uh, you know, unfold like this more or less. Right. Um, uh, but I do think that, you know, uh, soon enough market participants are going to realize that real rates are not going to be climbing higher. Um, and, you know, once they do realize that, gold is going to be uh, on its way to higher highs uh, once again. Uh, keep in mind that gold, uh, especially gold, tends to have multi-year bull markets. So if we assume that the beginning of this bull market was in the end of 2015, which somebody can make an argument that the beginning of this bull market was actually during the summer of 2018. So that just like two years ago, right? When we had that low over there. But even if we assume that, you know, the beginning of it was, uh, you know, in 2015, just, you know, look at the duration of the previous bull markets uh, for gold and you'll realize that they were multi, multi-year. I mean, they lasted a lot more and they produced, you know, much, much bigger gains. And that, uh, I think, in an environment that was never uh, as supportive as it is now. I, I do think, of course, that in the past, during these bull markets, we had very, very supportive and, you know, fundamental environment for gold. But I think it was never that much as it is now. Because not only we're getting a lot of stimulus at the moment, not only we're getting 
uh, a higher chance than ever in the past to see stagflationary environment. Not only um, we don't even have any target in sight of when this insanity might, might, might come to an end. I mean, the Federal Reserve might have persuaded a lot of investors back in 2008 that what they were doing was a short-term gig that would be reversed within a period of a few years. That's what Bernanke claimed multiple times, one of them in front of Congress. And for a period of time, people might have, been, might have actually believed that. But I don't think there is anybody foolish enough to really believe that there is an exit strategy from the Fed. If there was no exit strategy from a $4 trillion uh, dollar balance sheet, um, like two, roughly 12 years ago, and with debt being much lower and deficits being much lower, there is definitely no exit strategy anymore, right? Um, there wasn't even then, but, you know, in retrospect now, everybody realizes that. Uh, but, you know, even if we assume that back then there might have been some kind of an exit strategy, there isn't one now. So um, I think that people shouldn't be trapped in all the nonsense. I see like a lot of people trying to claim that, you know, this has been, you know, the high and that's it. Now people that were buying at 2000 are going to be losing their money. Yeah, buying at 2000 made no sense in the short term. And we said that multiple times. The move was overdone in the short term. There's no question about it. Uh, but do I believe that people that actually were, uh, you know, short-term foolish enough to buy 2,000 before waiting for a pullback are actually, if they hold, um, uh, you know, in their holdings, they're, they're going to actually end up losing money? No, I don't think they're going to end up losing money. I think in the long term, they're actually going to make a lot of money as well. Um, it's not that I'm advocating that you should be buying or selling with a bad risk reward, but, you know, still. Um you know, same deal more or less with silver. I mean, silver had an explosive move higher. Uh, from a technical perspective, as long as we trade above $19, there is absolutely, you know, no reason why I would want to even consider the possibility of, uh, you know, being short or whatever. Um, I think there is a very good chance that we're going to see another leg lower, at least one more leg lower. Um, I think like 2660 was, you know, this 2630, 2650, that was an interesting area of resistance. Even if silver rebounds higher, there is a chance we're going to see another leg lower towards like 22, 21, at an extreme case scenario, even back down to 19. But I think that's going to be, you know, if you get that lucky, that's going to be a magnificent, magnificent buying opportunity. Um, we have a question about so DXY below 88 was not out of the world and has been in the past. Don't think it's the end of world as much as Steve says. It will be just a rotation and currency is definitely to stay as long as people need it. And unless there is some huge disaster for mankind. So let me understand. You believe that the dollar is not easy to go below 88 when in fact it was trading at 70. So it was trading at 70 with the US economy being at a much better uh, position than it currently is. But you think that 88 is a buying opportunity? Okay. Good luck. You be my guest and buy at 88. Um, you know, that's what makes a market at the end of the day, right? I'm not saying that dollar is going to move in a straight line because almost nothing does. But do I believe that dollar is eventually going to bridge through 88 and move a lot lower? Absolutely. Um, platinum, natural gas, TLT, Aussie yen. Yeah, Aussie yen. This is something we haven't recently had a look at, but it's interesting. That's why I'm going to have a look at it at the moment. We spoke about it at some point, if I remember, last week, and I, I actually showed this triangle, uh, this ascending triangle. So... I think it's an interesting formation here for multiple reasons. First of all, it's a flat top triangle, uh, which, you know, it's very appealing in the sense you have a very well-defined resistance. You also have now a very well-defined support and the range in between is very, very tight. So that means that sooner rather than later, out of necessity, there's going to be a breakout. Now, it looks to me like it wants to break to the upside. We also have this interesting trend line uh, in the RSI index as well. So we are concurrently now testing uh, both this horizontal trend line resistance 
um, you know, on the price chart, but we're also testing this descending trend line resistance in the RSI. I think a breakout from this 7680, you, you want to say, you know, it's 77 to, you know, to, to round it up, it's not going to make in the grand scheme of things, it's gonna, not going to make much, much of a difference. I think it's going to be in, you know, a, a nice technical breakout with the next uh, upside area of interest being at 81. So more or less, you know, that would point, in my opinion, to likely 300 people move to the upside. Uh, in the case of the OGM. So I do think it's an interesting chart. Um, and, and it is one that I'm actually paying close attention to because I, I think we're going to have developments very, very soon. Uh, platinum natural gas, listen, nothing really has changed since yesterday in platinum. I'm going to be very brief. Platinum above 875, still bullish. Above this confluence of supports at 875, it's still bullish, remains in this ascending channel. Natural gas, Looks like to me like it's forming some type of a bull flag above 205, still remains bullish. And I think it looks good for another extension higher towards 2.5, 2.6, something like that. Uh, eyeing the 10 year like a hawk. Yeah, 10 year obviously, you know, you know, uh, I mean, correlates with a lot of stuff in the market. And, you know, the market always pays attention to what the bonds are doing. Um, uh, another question about those again, we did cover that now. Nifty natural gas, natural gas we did cover. Having to do with uh, indices, you know, nothing has really changed since yesterday. Just to reiterate here very briefly, 3,400, 3,397 to be exact is the first area of resistance. Above that, we also have at 3,416, the 161.8% extension of this move. So, you know, a lot of resistances between 3,400 and 3,415 in the S&P, having to do with the NASDAQ, still paying attention to this ascending channel, 11,540 is a nice FIB extension. Another one can be fi found at 11,700. So between 11,500 and 700, you know, a nice area of resistances. I would, I would definitely start being very careful there. Or alternatively, if we break through this, channel trend line support, then you should start getting, you know, very cautious. Uh, I've already said that the VIX chart is sending out signals that you should be very, very careful because, you know, it keeps diverging and diverging uh, both in comparison to the S&P. Um, you know, that's uh, in any case, the volatility of the S&P, right? And uh, it's also diverging having to do with, you know, RSI, so on and so forth. So. Um, I, I think this is not the place anymore that you should be long. I mean, if you're long, holding your position and, you know, uh, monitoring support levels makes sense. But buying, you know, the S&P or the NASDAQ up here, you know, to initiate fresh position is, is, is just crazy. If you ask me, as it was crazy, if you attempted to do that with gold at 2000, 2050 without having a prior position. So, you know, it's, it's the same type of concept. I mean, you know, all, you know, all of the US index indices definitely are in desperate need of some type of a, you know, uh, pullback to uh, work out the overbought conditions at the very least. S&P's valuations are getting eerily close to the 2000 highs, which means that if, if if this uh, continues for a little bit longer, the S&P will actually surpass the 2000 um, uh, valuations and that tells you all you need to know. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that the bubble can grow bigger, right? This is what bubbles do, but I'm just saying that, you know, you should at least wait for pullbacks to make somewhat more of a sense getting exposure to these markets. Unless, you know, you're the type of investor that you just want to close your eyes, jump on something and, you know, cross your fingers and hope for the best. But in my opinion, this is not a long-term strategy that can uh, result in anything else than you being, uh, uh, you know, broke. So, you know, you want to take my advice, fine. You don't you own your decisions. Yeah. As Nikita says, gambling is not the right thing to do in any case. Um, now, uh, something that's not very popular, uh, unfortunately, I forgot to mention it earlier, 
Um, I was monitoring both the OZIC, uh, the OZIC ad um, and the Kiwi CAD. Um, I forgot to mention the Kiwi CAD last week, and it unfortunately has already broken down quite significantly. The OZIC CAD is seems to be lagging. Uh, I, I find these ascending wedges quite interesting as formations. Um, so I do think if you want uh, to look at something that doesn't give you any dollar exposure and looks interesting from a technical perspective, but perhaps you should consider um, short positions in the OZCAD and the uh, KiwiCAD. And one more thing I wanted to show today, and anyhow, I, I think I've run out of time, is the Cadian. We had mentioned the Cadian last week, and specifically I remember saying that's in an interesting rectangle, which it has to eventually break either higher or lower. And it has actually broken, like, earlier this week to the upside. And this is quite a nice bullish development. I, and I do think it should be um, producing, you know, even more gains. I, I would be looking towards 82 to begin with, but even 83, uh, perhaps attacking once again, this uh, longer term ascending channels and line resistance. Nice look. Thank you, Dale. Who, who do we have today? Dana Lyons. Okay. And Dana was uh, great last time, even though he was bullish. Uh, he came up with a, a thesis that we were still in a secular bear market and, you know, that washout we had on the COVID crash. Yeah, wait, secular kinda... bear market uh, in the US and this is what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, stick around for this one. Okay, so uh, Dana, welcome back to FACE. I'm going to get you set up as a panelist. Where are you? Uh, Dana Lyons, you said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm promoting. Don't okay. worry. Okay. There we go. Uh, Hi, Dana. Wait, wait, wait. Give it some time. I'm unmuting. What a producer. There we go. Welcome back, Dana. Thanks, Dale. Nice to be back. Okay, so do you remember how to use Zoom to share your screen? Uh, well, how about that green button that says share exactly. screen? <laughs> That's the one. I tell okay. you, you are a, you're like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> All right. Should I just click that and just leave right. it on that? Yeah. Click that and then choose the screen you want. Click to that and then you have to choose which screen or window you want to share. And then I you're good to you. go. I got you. Excellent. So I was really looking forward to you coming back. I was just telling Steve that Last time you were there and, you know, it was before the highs that we had in February. I'm not exactly sure, but you still brought up the secular case, uh, mm -hmm. secular bear case. And um, that's what it did, uh, you know, kind of uh, just washed out under those lows for, you know, to go to the bottom of the megaphone. Yeah. And um, that was uh, a great call that no, no one, no one's saying that we're in a secular bear. So, Right. Um, even though they're long and participating in the market, I'm not saying you're a perma bear. I know your positioning is with the trend. Yeah. So I guess the question is now, Dana, that we had that break and here we are at new highs. Was this just like a continuation of a broadening formation? Um, uh, why don't you tell us what you're seeing? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it depends what index you're talking about. So, um, uh, and it and it depends uh, not just on you know a price series like the S and P five hundred, but it, it, it we're really uh, uh, um, uh, talking about the, the the economy, the market, the broad stock market as a whole. So uh, our thesis was still that you know in two thousand we topped out and uh, the way that secular cycles work is you have 
a uh, big buildup over, you know, secular bull market over a couple of decades and you build up these excesses in the market and the economy and they have to be worked out and corrected before a sustainable bear, uh, bull market can, can, uh, can start, can commence. Um, that won't let that out. happen, Dana, will they? Pardon? Well, that's, uh, that, that was going to be my point, you know, in okay, 2009. Yeah. Oh, it, it works just like physics. You know, you go to uh, an extreme to one side, then you have to go to the extreme the other side. It's like uh, Isaac's uh, laws of physics. Uh, right. And we uh, basically in 2009, it was bad, but we really got down to the mean in a lot of uh, economic and market metrics, valuation, uh, the percentage of household assets and stocks, uh, even price trend itself. So we never corrected to, you know, the, the, the bearish to the downside extreme like we needed to. Thanks in, in part, I think, to the Fed and central bank intervention, uh, like you mentioned. So I think that had a lot to do with it. So now we have a lot of those excesses that are still in the system from 2000, uh, in addition to everything that's uh, been put in uh, since then. So I don't like to opine too much on central bank stuff, but uh, just looking at why the cycle hasn't played out like it always has, I think that has a lot to do with it. Now, um, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, you know, we have the S&P 500 back uh, testing all-time highs. But if you look at, for example, here's the value line geometric composite on my screen. You see the top right. in actually 1998. We've gone pretty much sideways since then after, uh, after the long bull market uh, preceding it. So uh, it, the median, this, uh, the, the value line uh, tracks the median stock performance in the market. So basically we've gone uh, nowhere. Now most people are in something like the large cap, the S&P, uh, uh, some of the NASDAQ type, whatever's popular in the day. So uh, most people have done a little bit better than this, sure. Um, uh, but if you look at the broad market of stocks, we really, it's, 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 it's still conceivable uh, to make that secular bear market um, uh, thesis. So uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, as you alluded to, that doesn't mean that uh, we're going to invest our, our clients' money based on that. We're more intermediate term duration, so for Two to six months, our normal signal lasts. So we're gonna we're gonna have to be on the right side of the market during that intermediate term um, duration, or else all our clients are going to uh, fire us. Did, so. did the magnitude of this bounce after that crash uh, surprise you? It did. Um, I'll I'll tell you, not much surprises me in the market anymore. But the magnitude, the way we bounce back. I mean, face it, we had the biggest, swiftest crash in the history of the U.S. markets. Right. To expect the swiftest rebound in the history of the U.S. markets was, uh, uh, if, if you're going to tell me that you expected that, I, I'm not sure I would believe you. So I was, yeah. we were surprised at that. Um, at the same yeah, I, time, I was trying to sell failing rallies at different Fib levels. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah. The big, the big one. If you look at the value line here, the big, uh, the big level was in. Um, early June. So this is uh, uh, still, if you look at the broad market. So in early June, we pretty much failed right at that 61 retracement from the 2018 top. Also, you had a couple uh, that, that the green lines, the 200 moving day. Uh, so you had a bunch of um, technical reasons why we should fail there, even though the S&P and some of the large cap averages had moved uh, well above those uh, corresponding levels. So we did top out uh, this, this move in early June, um, kept that, um, kept the bear market, not the uh, secular one, but the uh, uh, near term bear market um, thesis on the table that, uh, that this move since March was merely a bear market rally. Now, recently, we've seen some of these lagging areas, the market, uh, small caps, Financials, energy, uh, uh, some of the European um, and international markets uh, move back above some key uh, resistance levels, opening up further upside. So that um, that does open up a, a little bit further upside. And we have uh, some of the leaders going to all time highs. So um, it makes you reconsider the fact that, OK, we had a bear market in March. Uh, this is just a bear market rally. So maybe obviously maybe it's something more than that. 
and you have to consider that uh, it's going to extend even a, a little bit farther. Um, okay, here's a key question for yes, you, sir. Dana. Yeah. I'm transferring my million dollar trading account to your RIA. All yeah. cash. All right. It's all cash. Yes, sir. What do we do here? Uh, uh, the way the our our philosophy is we're going to be uh, investing with the trend. The trend right now is up. Our risk model, uh, okay. which is comprised of a lot of breath measures, is strong enough. It's stagnant a little bit now, but uh, it is still. Uh, in a buy position, so we are still. Um, so you put long. some of that money to work, all well, of it. We're still, we're still bullish. The problem is right now is uh, it's not. Well, well, like I, I met, uh, like I heard, I was listening to your uh, prior uh, commentator, and uh, he was mentioning if you're long now, we would stay long. If uh, if if you're if you got a lot of cash on hand, we wouldn't necessarily be. The, Deploying all that cash right here, so right. that's basically in the position we're in. So we're long, okay. we're long a lot of the uh, longer term relative strength areas, uh, technology, uh, healthcare, stuff like that, stuff that's been working for a long time. A lot Are you of there for the miners? And gold miners, exactly. The gold miners yeah. as well. So um, we those those. Um, relative strength leaders. That's our philosophy. We want, we want to be in the stronger areas of the market over the longer term. So those areas, we'd be looking to redeploy that money uh, and okay. buy the dips. Um, the the the, uh, the laggards that have come on of late, small caps, financials, energy. Uh, those are more of a flat. That's more of a flash in the pan type of move to us as of now. Until it's uh, until until they show something. Uh, on a longer term basis, we're going to avoid those areas. We're going to sell those rallies. We're going to even uh, try to short some of those uh, areas into uh, into resistance. So uh, we've seen. Dana, it, Dana yes, isn't that also a sign of a rally being long in the tooth when they rotate into the trash, non performing stocks? Sure, that can be. Um, uh, it, it's we ha we have a number of other red flags that we've uh, that we've noticed as well. Some uh, some breath breath has held up okay. We've seen some uh, some one off days where we've seen big rallies on terrible breath, and that has often happened in uh, near near peaks in the market, although not always. So that's more of uh, you know like I said one off uh, little red flags. Uh, we also see, uh, like your prior commentator uh, mentioned, we see volatility holding up relative uh, to the, um, the, the the moves we've seen in prices. Uh, yeah, so we never is, filled that gap at 18. Yeah, um, that's that's a concern. Uh, yeah. But I would say it, it's not uh, in our, according to our uh, models, it's not enough of a concern to uh, get too defensive yet here. So. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we're kind of, I wish I could say we're at, at a bottom or we're at a top and, uh, now's the, the, the time to make a lot of moves, but, uh, basically, uh, we're in kind of a holding pattern. We're still long. We're just not going to be that a, a, as aggressive in, um, putting money to work right now. Here's the, uh, the VIX. Right. Yeah. We didn't fill that gap actually held the, uh, 88 retracement and some other support areas around yeah. the 1920 level. So, um, it, it even perhaps even more interesting, the, um, the volatility index and the NASDAQ 100, which is held up well above the, uh, well above the, uh, prior lows, actually well above the, even the June and July We're making lows. higher lows. Yeah, so that's uh, you know one of those red flags. Uh, it doesn't yeah. go into our models necessarily. It's not an actionable indicator for us. But yeah, up uh, until the last couple of days, uh, growth has been they rotated out of it for a while, and Nasdaq hasn't made a new high for, gosh, almost a week or two. Yeah, so it seems is like a lifetime when S and P's do it every other day. Uh, exactly. You know, I wanted to bring up something that I think just began this week. Uh, 10 years, uh, the 10 year yield chart was like a patient mm -hmm. in a coma, their EKG for a long mm -hmm. time. And to me, it looks like we're coming out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a two week reversal signal in the 10 year. And I can make a case for 120 in the 10 year. 
Um, I know a lot of, and the, the mantra that is so universal, and we were even talking about notes and stuff here, mm-hmm. is first of all, you, you don't want to fight the Fed, but everyone is saying lower for longer. Right. Paul's saying, I'm not even thinking about, thinking about, thinking about raising rates. Market, uh, you know, he doesn't right. have to do it. Um, what's your view on yields here? And would a move to 120 in the 10 year upset which apple carts? Uh, well, first of all, our so <clears throat> taking a, a step back, the long, if you leave the long term, long, long term uh, cycle of yeah. interest rates, we are due to bottom the 60 year cycle, roughly. We we're due, due to bottom out in rates about 10 years ago. So you talk about another. Uh, okay. cycle that has been kind of upset by maybe the, some of the central bank um, action that's uh, taking place here and around the world. So back in uh, really all, and when you talk about lower for longer, I think it's a psychological, a key psychological um, factor or condition for putting in a long-term bottom in uh, rates. Cause all you heard from, Around in, in, in the 2000s, from 2000 to, uh, up towards the financial crisis, all you heard about was, okay, rates have to go up. There's nowhere to go but up. And once we got to that lower for longer, okay, we're going to be yeah. in this uh, low rate environment forever, negative rate environment. Um, then you put in the psychological condition where we can put in a long-term low and then start rising, which we think we will. Uh, so we think rates go up for, you know, decades to come. Uh, when that starts, I don't know. I would have thought that we thought it would have started in 2016 at that low. Didn't happen, obviously. It, well, we rose for a couple of years, but uh, now we're back uh, making historic lows. But if you, if you zoom well, out. Well, we didn't make historic lows. We got down to 50. And the spike on COVID, I think, was 34. Mm-hmm. And now it looks like we're starting to head up. And, you know, I'm not talking about this wave going to 4% on the 10-year. Yeah. But yeah. Why, why not back to 120, which was a pretty important support level before the acceleration? And do you think the market's prepared for that would be like up uh, 125% from uh, the recent uh, reading of 50? Yeah. Would it matter? I don't – it would – Oh, it absolutely would matter. I don't think anyone's prepared for that. What, what my historic move was that move in March. I'm saying, and right. if you if you look if you're looking for this is uh, kind of anecdotal, but if you're looking for an ending type of a move, this blow off that we had in March that would certainly be uh, significant enough to end a uh, long term 40, 30, 40 year uh, run in um, in interest rates. But you talk about the one twenty level i'm looking at the same thing uh, held uh, support at 50 basis points testing right. that 50 day now trying to get above yeah. if we do decisively break above that 50 day here around 65 basis points i'm looking up towards uh, about 108 or so okay. on the uh on the um tenure and up about if we break that maybe i'm looking at 150 so i could okay. see that happening quickly Obviously, okay. there. Uh, I don't know anyone. What that- would be behind it? Because everyone will go, why? You know, why did the tenure go from uh, half to over one? The Fed's not doing it. What would could it uh, still be with everything the Fed has done? You know, before we had the crash, we had those issues in the repo market last yeah. fall. Could it still be that there's liquidity issues and certain? Money markets, uh, I can't think of any other reason for uh, rates to make this move. I'm wondering how, I'm not a reporter, yeah. but I'm trying to guess how they're going to explain it. I, you you know, I, I thank God I'm not a reporter either, so you got to come up with reasons. Well, they come to hey, us. We'll, the, we'll, yeah. we'll have an explanation then. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> I, well, the boring answer is I don't care what the reason is, you know, because we're going to follow That's the not market boring. data. And that's that wisdom. Follow, yeah, we're going right. to follow prices. So I don't yeah. know what the reason would be. This is yeah. still a free market, right? So this is not Fed well, funds. We don't get set by the Fed funds. So this okay. move, this this market's going to move based on market forces. And uh, for whatever reason, if we go up there, it's that that's where the market is uh, has to go. 
So it's yeah. not, you know, a couple central bankers setting rates uh, on the tenure. Uh, obviously, they have a huge influence over that, uh, but they can't necessarily control that. So with the market forces, there are a couple of things we've talked about it before, a couple of things that are bigger and more powerful and um, uh, 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 I guess uh, 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 stronger than any central banker, any policymaker um, can. Uh, they don't have the ability to permanently uh, control things like the economy, the stock market, uh, uh, the, the tenure, the bond market forever. You know, they can distort right. it perma- uh, uh, temporarily. They can't permanently control markets like that. They're too too many players, too much money too strong uh, a force for one, you know, individual or one central bank to necessarily um, uh, distort forever. So that's my Someone just said printing 7 trillion in a matter of months gives you a lot of control. Sure, it does. Uh, And and we've seen, heck, we've seen- The result of it. I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned the uh, interest rates were due to bottom. The window was about 10 years ago. So yeah. yes, you can you can distort it for a while, um, not permanently, not 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 based on hundreds and hundreds of years of history. Okay, um, so uh, if we get this move that you think is viable, could happen, uh, what's going to suffer? Utilities, uh, rates, yeah, uh, for, interest for, sensitive for, sectors. Sure, sure, dividend, uh, dividend. Uh, stocks, obviously, uh, things that have uh, those, those types of areas that have been uh, been lagging for uh, some time. So um, that would, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, those areas we'd be avoiding. So we're still we're already avoiding those areas, but uh, uh, it's the, the the utilities uh, had been. It was interesting. The utilities were one of those leaders. Uh, for a long time, uh, like the growth areas of the market that were leading, you had weird things like utilities doing well. And all of a sudden, over since uh, about April or early May, they have not been doing well. So why is that? I don't know. They haven't. So maybe that's uh, a harbinger of uh, some kind of an interest rate move here. So maybe the thing to really avoid would be um, weak credits. If they're weak credits now, now I'm talking about mm-hmm. junk, which used yeah. to be, you know, triple A, yeah. um, that a rise in rates of a point um, might cause some duress in the bond markets. What do you think? Yeah, that's true. And we've seen, uh, if you've been looking at uh, junk bonds of late, we've seen, um, uh, we, we've seen them struggling. Uh, some of the, uh, at least the junk bond ETFs, they've not kept up with the uh, recent bounce and some of the junkier equity uh, issues and equity equity spaces that we've seen of late. We've not seen high yield keep up with that. So that, uh, to your point, that might be, uh, that might be a sign of exactly that uh, in the works here. How do you label what we're going to be facing with, you know, all of this, artificial actions that have taken place, I think, you know, really to keep everything going <clears throat> to year end, which includes the election, right? Yeah. Uh, do, next year, uh, and a lot of it depends upon, you know, do we get a second wave? Is called, you know, do people uh, stay home, uh, reinforce their lack of consumer spending, uh, especially the, the people with money over 55, 60 that are higher risk? Uh, do you think that what we're facing is a credit crisis coming or a solvency crisis and isn't there a difference between the two yeah i think um i i I think it's going to be just a straight up demand issue you know it's going to be i I have to think it's going to be uh extremely uh deflationary what's going on in terms of uh shutting down the economies um uh, the lack of yeah, obviously a solvency issue for many, many small businesses, which are just going to uh, vaporize. So um, whatever it is, uh, you know, again, we don't care what's happening. All we care, all our clients yeah, care about price. is what's happening in, in the markets itself. So we're going to, uh, I've told 
a lot of people, uh, I, we continue to say that we ignore all the fundamental data, uh, the economic data when we're uh, managing uh, markets. Uh, if that, okay. if it, if it, yeah. well, if if to the extent that the economic data is uh, is relevant and pertinent to you know the moves in the markets, it's going to show up in the data from the market. So we look at only quantitative data from the from the markets itself. And if it's uh, if it's relevant, it's going to feed into it. So the markets are the that you look at the stock market is the best discounting mechanism in the history of the world, right? Yeah, people the, are the, voting human, with their wallet. Exactly, and humans can't process that faster than uh, uh, like billions of inputs faster than the stock market. So take your cues from the markets. Um, ignore the noise unless you're, you know, the, the greatest for even the greatest forecasters of the market uh, of the economy and fundamentals. You can get that right and still get the market reactions wrong. So uh, we'll stick with uh, yeah. the market. A call data. and a trade are two different things. So sure. uh, how about the dollar, Dana? Uh, dollar uh, has uh, given up, uh, you know, euro from 108 to 118. Uh, you have a view on the dollar here. Is this uh, a severe breakdown on your technical work? Um, it's a breakdown in the near term on the dollar. So uh, long term, I up in the era, we don't have really a long term uh, um, uh, view. view. We're not taking a stance on that in the short term. I would say the benefit of the doubt is to the downside in dollar index with next uh, level around 91. So we're trading around 93, right? Anything up towards 96, we'd be selling it. Um, okay. 96, 96 and a half would be selling it. Maybe even uh, take a, a shot out, up there on the short side. So right now, benefit of the doubt is to the downside in the dollar. Okay, and I know you have friends and and relatives that aren't your clients, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I get asked this all the time. Dale, with what's happening in the economy and what could happen in the economy, I just don't understand. How could the market be making new highs? What do you tell them? <laughs> well, again, you, get, like you I, get asked that question, don't you? Yeah, like well, like I like I just said, it, it, we that's why we ignore the economic and who in the right mind would be uh, expecting all time highs right now coming off right, of that, what, the, the, the GDP dropping by a third and right. uh, uh, ten percent of the labor force got laid off in one month. I mean, yeah. who in the right mind would be uh, it, it would have their any money at all in the market right now? Um, right. So, it's, so how I, do you explain I, I, it to divorce, people? I, I say don't even try to uh, reconcile the two. Divorce yourself from uh, 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 the fact that uh, the the market has to go with the economy. Or I say, you know, find a find a good objective risk conscious money manager and let them manage the money for you because uh, they'll know how to they'll 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 know the inputs to look for. They'll know what to ignore and uh, they don't get hung up on, you know, trying to explain, trying to reconcile the two. So how are you doing uh, this year, Dana? A uh, little bit more than halfway through the year ended quarters. Um, uh, how did you weather that uh, decline, et cetera? Uh, we we weathered it pretty well. So, I mean, that's our calling card. We're going to, we're going to aggressively manage risk when we detect it. So, uh, we lost a little bit uh, in the first quarter, you know, the small single digits. Um, so uh, we aggressively uh, uh, went to fest defensive there uh, in the uh, in the in the early March, right? Um, yeah, right in the beginning, towards the beginning of that swoon. So we had some red flags going into that top. We were about our our. Our, our risk model was a week late in getting um, a sell signal. So almost a perfect sell signal, but that first, that last week of February was really bad, if you remember. Yeah. So we got clipped a little bit, small, small single digit losses. Um, since then, we've uh, we made ba basically triple back what we lost there. So nice. uh, I think our clients are, are happy. We are always going to uh, lag a little bit in the explosive moves off the bottom like we saw in March. So 
Uh, certainly, we've lagged the market. We're not up 50% from uh, the March lows. But, um, you know, you keep, you keep your losses small. You keep your drawdown small. You don't have to recover as quickly. You don't have to make as much back on the rebound just to get back to even and then start growing your, your money again. So that's why uh, we always preach the most important thing is keeping those losses, keeping those drawdowns uh, small, relatively small. So, Dane, if someone wanted to, you to manage a part of their portfolio, how would they reach you and get a hold of you and discuss it with you? Um, well, you can reach uh, you can reach us. I've got um, uh, uh, several. We got a website, but we got several uh, uh, blogs, several services that we can uh, that we do provide. So, you want to show them? Uh, sure. Let me. Uh, uh, let me uh, figure out new share. Yeah. what's that new you share. might have to do a new okay. share perfect all right yeah. um <clears throat> the best way is uh let me still figure this out buddy um how do i get on okay here we go um best way to get a hold of us uh you can check out our um Website uh, is LionShare. The LionShare, it's at LionSharePro.com. You can find contact information there. Uh, we have, this is one service. We have our management service. This uh, LionShare is more or less a um, do-it-yourself service where we provide basically on a daily basis uh, what we're looking at, what we're looking to buy and sell and uh, uh, subscribers uh, that, pull the trigger themselves, but it's kind of a uh, open lens into uh, how we're managing money uh, and, and, and the kind of things we're looking at. But uh, if you want to, um, uh, as far as our management service, uh, it's jlfmi.com and you can uh, email me at uh, info at jlfmi.com or dlions at jlfmi.com and uh, you can find us that way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you're looking for a way to manage risk and uh, add a, a significant risk overlay to your investment uh, portfolio, that's really our calling card. So like I you said, go. you know, at not, at, we're not going to try to squeeze every single penny out of every up move in the market. We're going to manage risk, keep our drawdowns low. And, um, uh, the difference between difference between pros and amateurs are pros know how to lose. So they have money left to be right with. Exactly. So, That's the most important um, yeah. uh, factor, knowing when to pull the trigger on the sell side. Absolutely. Best idea going into the election, Dana. Into the election. Um, wow. Um, you know, right now, like I said, it's not, it's boring, but we're, we're, we're following the same stuff that, uh, that has been, uh, uh, working. working. So we're not, we're not, yeah. we're not, we're not going okay. to flash in the pan recent, uh, moving the small caps and financials and, and whatnot. We'll stick to, to the longer term trends, technology and healthcare and, um, go with okay. that one, one, I would say one, um, uh, uh, one long shot would be Taiwan. We like Taiwan in the long term. Why? Why? Because of the chart. Um, we have. Okay. Uh, I if have I known. can, uh, if I can do a quick uh, screen share, if I have time for that. Yeah, um, go ahead. Okay. So we've had. You talk about uh, a long term bear market. We had Taiwan, uh, which topped out in 1990. <laughs> so whatever's like going on, the, I know when the Japanese did. Yeah, I don't know what's going on in, in uh, a lot of things going on politically in uh, China and Taiwan, Hong Kong. But you had that top in uh, 1990 in Taiwan, the Taiwan major index, and you had a series of highs for uh, the next uh, 25 years broke out of there uh, a, uh, a couple of years ago. We've been consolidating. Just broke to a new high, all-time high here at the right wow. of the chart above the 1990 uh, yeah. high. I mean, you talk about, they say the longer the base, the bigger the space, the upside. This is massive yeah. upside potential if this uh, breakout is for real. So if you want yeah. you know, a wild card in your portfolio, uh, you're looking okay. at uh, emerging markets, this would be the one that we would pick. I'll call it your speculative shot. Okay. Sure. 
Well, we're All along right. this already. EWT would be the uh, ticker symbol, which is tracks it pretty well. It's actually at new all-time highs as well. So EWT, um, yeah, okay. small speculative All right, buddy. position. Well, I, you know, I hope you and your family stay in touch. Any view on COVID? It, the, now we're just praying that um, everyone stays well and that this thing runs its course quicker, uh, you know, qu yeah. quicker, sooner than later. So uh, okay, I don't buddy. have the view on it, but praying okay. for uh, everyone out there to stay safe and uh, socially distance. And uh, hopefully this thing runs its course soon. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your views with us today, Dana. I always yeah. enjoy it. And uh, I know I could ask you anything and you'll come right back to price. Yeah, I, I appreciate <laughs> it. They always, always right. enjoyable uh, talking to you and yeah, price is truth and um, stick with That's that. Good. Ignore the noise, right? All right. My trading warrior brother, everyone, Dana Lyons, you know where to find him. Um, I would trust him with the, uh, if I had a lot of money, I'd give you a piece, Dana. <laughs> Thanks, so, Dana. A, a, anyway, so uh, that's going to be a wrap. We'll see everyone for TGIF tomorrow. And again, my trading warrior brother, I appreciate your views. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I could kind of tell that uh, you're getting a little strongly neutral here after this advance. Uh, let me know when you guys get a sell signal and let's get together maybe after the election and see what's uh, happening price-wise then. Sounds great. Always a pleasure, Dale. Thank you. All right, Dana. All right, everyone. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. We'll see everyone tomorrow. You're welcome. Adios.